Okay, we're going to start with vowels and consonants. Anybody have any questions? Yes, Wendy. Uh, case one, one, uh, 84, uh -huh. the first time. Uh, it says, uh, Can everybody be quiet for a minute? The languages of the world have from 3 to 24 or more different uh, vowel qualities. Uh, vowel qualities. Vowel qualities. Yeah. Okay, let me borrow your book. Yes. Yes. I was thinking this material doesn't sound right for today. <laughs> um, you can think about it when we get to that chapter. <laughs> okay, how about questions on this chapter? Yeah. Uh -huh. Triangle. Everybody listen to this one. Triangle. Triangle. In our study on Taiwan English, most people said triangle, which is wrong. So some teachers must be teaching it, otherwise I don't know where it's from. Right, Vivian? Yeah? Some teachers must be teaching it, otherwise where did we get this? It's very consistent, Taiwan English. Yeah. I think it also has to do with triangular. Yes, I thought of that because the adjective form is triangular, which is correct. But the noun is triangle. Everybody fix that. Why would so many people make mistakes based on the adjective form? Because photograph, photography, nobody says photograph, right? Although maybe in that case, the adjective did influence the noun pronunciation. But it's almost 100% in Taiwan English, people say triangle. It's coming from somewhere. So please know it's triangle, 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 triangular triangle, yeah. And if it has four angles, is it rectangle? Rectangle. 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 Same. They're all the same. Rectangle. Rectangle. I didn't even think of rectangle. Do some people say rectangle? I, okay. Okay. Thanks for the information. Because I didn't, I didn't use that as an item on the, in the recording. I only used triangle. And almost everybody said triangle. Triangle. Rectangle. All right, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt like that, but it was an important point. Go ahead. Um, is that, um, if, if they consider the oh, wait a minute. I'm sorry. Quiet? Are we okay unless you need to solve something here? Is it okay? Okay, sorry. If the listener considers the second word to be twice as far apart as it should give them a number twice as big, so I don't know how they, they give it. The numbers. Okay, I'm going to need to borrow your book. I had too many books today. I didn't want to bring this. So you're reading right where? Oh, here. Thank you. Okay. Another way of calculating the degree of similarity between a pair of sounds is simply to ask people to give a number corresponding to how similar they are. In one way of doing this, a so-called free magnitude estimation technique, they can give any number to the first pair of words they hear. Then, if they consider the next pair of words to be twice as far apart, they should give them a number twice as big. If half as far apart, then they should give half the previous number, and so on. In one experiment, the procedure, this procedure was used to estimate the degree of similarity between all 15 pairs composed of the syllables pa, ta, ka, ba, da, ga. And the table shows the results for each pair. Um, did I cover everything you want to ask about? And your question again. Um, how to transform those numbers into those triangles? Ah, the I see. I think they're just using a unit of measurement. They're just using a, me a unit of measurement like centimeters or something. I think they're just using centimeters or something like that, some unit of measurement for each side because 4.750 is this long and then 3.205 is this long. I think that's what they're doing. But is, is this later, later that there's two, this is a two-dimensional figure, figure and that means those listeners have 
At least two ways to think the father son. Yeah. And I don't know what the other one is? You're asking what the other one is? Or what? I don't know what uh, this concept means. Ah, uh, okay, let me think about it. Oh, I think it's, are they talking about these two methods? The first one is confusion matrices. The first one, that's the first method, method, and this is the second method. So that's what they mean, there are two different methods. And in this method, we can make this table and then we can draw triangles, just using these as like measures of centimeters or whatever. Does that make sense or not? So what are those spaces? The spaces in the triangle? It just shows how different they seem to be from each other. From, from pa to ka, from ka to ta, from ta to pa. They just, pa and ta are this different. Ta and ka are this different. And then pa and ka are this different. So we're just spreading them out how far apart each one is from the others. Does that make sense or does it need more explanation? It makes sense? It's okay. Oh, I'm relieved, thank you. Sometimes the methods and the measurements and the tables don't make really good sense. You should ask, and I will do my best to try and sort it out for you. Okay? Anything else? Yeah. Uh -huh. Okay, I'm going to have to look at it. I almost brought the book and I saw it. My bag is too heavy. I'm sorry. Um, and sometimes you have no questions. You just sit there. So I thought maybe it'll be one of those days. I don't need the book. Okay. Um, so you're asking about what this figure means? All right, let's read it, and then the print has gotten smaller, so excuse me. Identification of six stimuli formed from a token of bad with a progressively shorter vowel so that it sounds more like bat. The scale on the left allows the percentage of times each stimulus was identified as bad, or not allow, sorry, shows, the percentage of times each stimulus was identified as bad as opposed to bat in solid points. Um, the scale on the right shows the percent correct in saying whether the five pairs of adjacent words were the same or different. Okay, this is actually kind of complex. But first of all, we're going to have six different stimuli, six different pronunciations of a syllable. And they range from bad to bat. Bad, bat, those are the two extremes. So going from bad to bat, we're gonna make the vowel shorter and shorter. So bad, 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 bat, bat. Then we end up with bat. So altogether six. And the scale on the left, they have two different scales here. Actually, they're the same numbers. But it says the scale on the left shows the percentage of times each stimulus was identified as bad as opposed to bad. So each time it, they heard bad, bad. And then bat is solid points. Ah, uh, 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 no. Each time the stimulus was identified as bad as opposed to bad is in solid point. So it makes it tinged out bad. Tajosushe is solid point. Um, the scale on the right shows the percent correct in saying whether the five pairs of adjacent words were the same or different. So, hayo uh, from bad to bad, a little shorter. So it shows how, whether the percentage of times that they were correct, when they said that bad is the same as bad, or when they said that bat is the same as bat. So if they're right next to each other, those are the open circles. This is actually quite complex, but if you sit down, this is what they're saying. So every time, um, so open circles. open circle But then the one on the, the other one is uh, the percentage of times each stimulus was identified as bad. So it's 
他的答案是 bad 有几次，不管对不对 ，bad 有几次。第二个是说正确率。So you're you're being asked a question about two different words. Are they the same or different? Or 你你你说这个是 bad 还是 bad？ 你说 bad 有多少次，他就给你那个黑色的 circle。可是你的嗯，紧邻的字，你答对了，他给你一个圈圈。来表现出来。This is actually it sounds much more complicated than it is.、Um, does it make sense or not? Or do you need a little time to think about it? Do you think you'll get it if you think about it a minute? Yeah, but I, I've told you what it is. You just need to think about it because it's it is complex. It takes a little bit of thinking, and then it will be okay. It's still complex, but it makes sense. Okay. Anything else? Anything else? Sorry, wrong chapter. <laughs> Anything else? If not, please hand in your work. What chapter for next time? Right. So we have just finished ten, then we have fifteen, then we have sixteen, and that's the end of the book. So we're going to have to crowd in a lot of stuff. What we're going to do today is finish chapter eight. We're not doing exercises today. That's for next Monday. Then we're going to go through the decibels tutorial, which is heavy, but I don't expect you to understand it all. I'm not really going to test you on it, unless it's a really basic question that sort of is in the textbook or we talked about a lot.、Uh, and that's it. That's that's our plan. If we have time after the tutorial, we'll go on to chapter nine, but I doubt that will happen. The tutorial is quite heavy. We're going to finish chapter eight. Miranda.、Mm. Page two hundred twelve.、Uh. Third.、Uh, let's see. One, two, three, four. It's the fourth complete paragraph. Second paragraph under individual differences. Individual variation is readily apparent when studying spectrograms. That's pretty good. Your spectrograms is now perfect. That's good. Apparent. I guess in the East they say apparent, no problem. But just for consistency, apparent, readily, they're all dao san. So variation, readily apparent, spectrograms, chambu do zhe dao san. It's fine. Keep going. In summarizing the uses of spectrograms, we were careful to say that they showed relative vowel quality. It is clearly true that one can use spectrograms such as that in Figure 8.14 to tell that the speaker has a higher vowel in three than in the in three than in the beginning of the vowel in here. Let's make sure we understand everything. When we look at spectrograms, we find a lot of individual variation. For example, the spectrogram that gave everybody so much pressure, right? I just like some linguists. You saw individual variation between the one in the book and between the one I made, right? They're both native speakers. Of course, I guess they're different dialects, but you see a lot of individual variation. That wasn't just dialect variation. Whenever we're reading spectrograms, you will find there are some things that are different just because they're different individuals reading. So, 有一些是个人的一些变异了，不一样 And When we were summarizing the uses of spectrograms, that was right before this section. Was at the bottom of 211. We may now summarize the kinds of information that can and cannot be obtained from spectrograms. This is the bottom of 211, and it says that. Where can we find something about relative? It's the next paragraph down. Spectrograms are usually fairly reliable indicators of relative vowel quality. That sounds like a pretty important important sentence. If he mentioned it again, so it's the second to last line on two eleven. Two eleven, 要不要翻一下？看一下。Second to the last line, spectrograms are usually fairly reliable indicators of relative vowel quality because every individual has their own baseline, and we have our own space. So within that space, we will be able to see the difference between e and a and a. For that person, but we can't generalize it to everybody else. The differences will be clear and reliable for that one person, for the data from that one person. We cannot just take the data, I'm、uh, sorry, the data in numbers, and then expect it to apply to other people. 
All right, so individual variation is important. When we look at a spectrogram, those are 相对的差别,还蛮可靠, but we can't use absolute numbers and generalize based on those. And then it says, it's clearly true that one can use spectrograms such as that in 8.14 to tell that the speaker has a higher vowel in 3 than in the beginning of the vowel in here. So, in 3, E, 3, compare it to the vowel I use in here. Mine is pretty high, 我的还蛮高的. But for some people, the E in here, and even mine, if you compare it, listen, 3, here, 3, here. Can you hear my E going down a bit to I? It's not to I, but it's going down a bit. 3, here, 3, here, here, 没有那么 E. Here, 有点太夸张了. 3, here. So there is a difference. Okay, between my two vowels, my vowels in those two words. So, in 8.14, let's go to 8.14. This sentence is, again, he left here three days ago. So compare here and three. The first vowel in here to the vowel in three. Three. You've already transcribed that. You've segmented and transcribed it. So the vowel in three should be more like an E than the vowel in here. Is that right? That means F2 should be higher. Is it? Is F2 higher? That's what they're talking about here. So just so you can see very concretely what they're talking about. Go ahead. One can also use Foreman plots such as that in figure 8.5. 8.5. 8.5 to show that the average American English vowel in hood is farther forward than that in hod. All right, let's look at 8.5. All right, it's 8.4 here, which is also marked CD 8.3, right? Because it's the American one. And what are they telling us to notice here? That the average American vowel in hood is farther forward than that in hot. So compare u to a. And what do we look at to compare what is forward? F1, F2, or F3? F2, right? Because F2 is forwardness and backness. And we've also got roundness counted in. So u is more forward than a. It's higher. Okay? Then, go on. But it, it is not so easy. But, but it is not so easy. But it is not so easy mm, to say whether the vowel in a given word as pronounced by one speaker is higher or lower than that of another speaker. So if we find that within one person's data, we find that one vowel is higher. One is more e, the other one is more i. One is more forward u than a. That's more back. These comparisons are valid for a single speaker, but we can't compare the u to, in this person with the u of another person. It's not reliable because everything is relative. That's all they're saying. So we can't make direct comparisons. Let's go on. In general, when two different speakers pronounce sets of vowels with a set of vowels, with the same phonetic quality, the relative positions of these vowels, mm. of, of these vowels, vowels and a formant, and a formant chart, mm. and a formant chart, and a formant chart, <laughs> and a formant chart yeah. will be similar, but the but similar. the will be similar, right. but but the absolute values of the formant frequencies mm. of the of the Formant frequencies mm -hmm. will differ from speaker to speaker. From speaker to speaker. Diga speaker ya dian because it's not the tonic. You don't have to, you said that your, your ji chao was making your voice higher, but you don't have to ke yi ba sing yin na gao. You will still get it right. Ni bu si yin wei sing yin gao, ni si yin wei ni tiao zheng guo lai le. So ni bu yong ke yi gao. So, in general, when two different speakers pronounce sets of vowels with the same phonetic quality, the relative positions will be similar. 
but the absolute values will differ. We're just repeating what we just said. Nothing new. Go on. Figure 8.18 shows the form 18, 18 mm -hmm. shows the formants for the vowels in heat, hit, head, hat, hot, hood, uh, hood, hood, as pronounced by two speakers of Californ Californian English. The Californian English of most, most university students does not distinguish between hot and hot or between cut and and caught, so it was possible to show only seven of eight vowels in figure 8.3. The relative position, positions of the vowels in each set are similar, but the absolute values are different. But the absolute values, right again? But, but the absolute values are different. That's better, good. So let's look at 8.18, and you can see here we've got empty circles and then blacked in circles. These are the same vowels, and in theory, they all are speaking the same dialect, namely Californian U.S. English. However, we see really big differences, don't we? We can see that the one with the circles, the white circles, is very stretched out, very long, and the other one is very compressed. So, they're different in that way. We can't transfer values from one to the other easily. But, So you can see that E is always going to be higher than I. You can see that E is always going to be uh, more front than U. Or I is even going to be more front than U. All of those Relative values are staying the same. Right? That's all we're saying. Let's go on. Will enable one. Can you link? Enable one. Right, right. Hmm? Make, it, make it two syllables. Mm-hmm. Again? To average out. Average out. Tom, yeah, there's a sort of a demisyllable. It's not really a full syllable. We don't say average out. It's not wrong, but it sounds too long and also average out. It's pretty much only two syllables. Average. Average. Yeah, just like family. We usually say family, right? Or mathematics. We say mathematics. Okay. Mm-hmm. The all right, everybody understands that so far. We have no very simple way of taking out all of these 个人化 the 变异. We can't take it out easily. There's no easy way to do it. So we're always going to have to deal with that in our data. Go on. One way to deal with the problem. With? With problem. With, sorry? With Okay. It's probably to regard the average frequency. Average. Average frequency of the form homing as an indicator of the individual's health sign. Mm -hmm. And then express the values of the other homings as percentage percentages of the mean for homing frequency. All right. That takes a little thinking. So stop and figure out this sentence in your head. It's not hard, but it's mathematical, so you need to process it in your brain in a mathematical way. Read it in your head and then see if you understand. If you don't understand, then tell me, I don't get it, can you explain it? We're trying to deal with this problem of individual variation. It's not easy to take it out. Here's one way that we can sort of deal with it. Not perfectly, but it deals with it a little bit. Look up when you're ready. Okay, how about if I just explain it as well as I can? If it's still not clear, then you ask questions. We're trying to deal with these big differences. We know that the relationships remain the same. We're just sort of stretching it out and we're compressing it. But that makes for sloppy data. This data is hard to deal with because there's so much variation. 
we can't collect a bunch of really good representative form and values if the individual differences are so great. How do we deal with that? I mean, the relationships stay the same, but the form and data is quite different. The numbers, the, the frequency data for the, for, the, for the formants is quite different from person to person. So that's going to make our data confusing and complicated. We want to find a way to try to normalize our data so that the, the individual differences are not so shenshu. Miranda, that makes sense? Yeah, it makes sense, thank you. <laughs> Sometimes I don't read your faces correctly. So with these big differences in individuals, they're still producing the same vowel qualities as far as the ears of an English speaker is concerned. Like, I'm going to hear very different formant values, but because the relationship to each other is all right, I will hear eh and uh. They're exactly the same vowel to me, even though they have different four. Well, I only made different frequency differences. I only made frequency differences because I'm the same person. But if someone has a very large head or a very small head, the whole 尺度会变,因为头的大小就是很重要的一个因素,不是唯一的. Another one is 内部的那个构造,可能跟头的大小没有直接的关系。可是我们就可以选头的大小来作为一个indicator,说这个可能是一个头很大的人,这是头比较小的人,念出来的。so, if we know the size of their head, we can use the data data Now it's clear, right? The last way I think was clear, and was expressing it relatively clearly. So, yeah. Because we've already identified what F1 measures, that's height, F2 is front backness plus rounding, F3 is rounding and R, rotisization, right? Mostly. It's not the only thing. But that's easy. I mean, that's, those are good enough for our purposes. F4, we hardly ever pay attention to. Although we did pay attention to it once. Let's, re let's remind ourselves when we noted F4. Let's go to our list that we made recently or read in the book. Do you remember where we saw F4 when we were talking about spectrogram reading? How about retroflexes? Look on page 204. Table 8.1, and look at the fifth item down. It says retroflex, page 204. What does it say? General lowering of the Right, and we've been saying all along, we only need one. One and two are the most important ones. One and two are by far the most important. R and rounding in three is also very useful. So one, two, and three are what we're mainly interested in, especially one and two. Beyond that, we're not so interested. But we already ran into one use for four, and that is here. It says that for retroflexes, not only the third foramen is going down, but the fourth is going down too. So we have had a use for it. In addition, we're going to match another index with F4, namely, 头的大小。到某一种程度,F4会反映出头的大小. That's what Latifoged and others have concluded based on the data that they've collected. Okay, so F4 tells us something. We're going to pretend that it's a pretty good reflection of how big the speaker's head is. Okay? So that's our assumption. It's maybe not completely reliable, but it's good enough for a working assumption. So let's just regard. And then, we 
比较能互相比较，因为这样它尺度会比较近。我们就是用 F4 来调整其他的 data 的尺度，让它那个尺度不要每个人尺度不一样，让每个人的尺度比较接近。That makes sense, I thought. Yes? 可以吗 ？Miranda? Not so clear? Did somebody understand what I said? And then can you please explain it in Chinese? Somebody? I understand, but I mean, so Lava uh, defines F4 as uh, a measure or index of. Head yeah. Because F4 actually somehow roughly indicates the head size. Yes. That's it. Then you got it. Thank you. If that's the only thing you were worried about, it doesn't. Yeah? That for the school don't say why. Ours is not to reason why. We're not going to question that right now because it's going to get too complicated. I don't know if it's right or not, but we're just now making sort of like a, we're doing a thought experiment. We're now doing a thought experiment. We're now doing a thought experiment. He's hedging. He says, let's regard it as. So we don't know. Um, he's got his reasons. I personally don't know enough to answer that any further. But right now, it's just a thought experiment based on an assumption. The assumption may be right or wrong, or maybe partly right. We're just going to try it out. We'll just All right? Well, I'm glad that you're questioning, questioning these things. You should be doing that. Okay? And then we're going to express the values of the other formants as percentages. So you can put all the people in the F form, give me a percentage, right? Give all the people in the F form. So the biggest is 100, right? The smallest is maybe 50 or whatever it is. Okay, we give them values. Then from 50 to 100, we can use their difference, use that to be used in other form of data, to adjust it, to make their width more close. Okay? So here, the, the mean first form is the uh, mean average of all people or individual? Of each individual. So the mean fourth form, we're going to get lots of data for F4, but we're just going to take an average of all the data. And computers can do that. It's not so hard. So he, from the beginning to the end, all the F4 frequency, all of them are averaged up. We get a average value, and then we use that as our measure of head size. Okay? For each individual, we'll have a different value for F4, average value. Okay? And we have a problem with this number one. Go ahead. Everything was fine except for you. You've got too many high tonics. The tonic, 最高的留到最后 You have the right idea. Stress, stress, tonic, stress, 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 tonic, stress, stress, stress. Last tonic, stress. Da 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 da. It sounded like Woody Woodpecker. Okay. Um, so try that. Let's see. Uh, let me read that sentence to you, and then see if you can sort of lower some of your non-final tonics. But this possibility is not open when the fourth form in frequencies, the fourth form in frequencies, you guys down. But this possibility is not open when the fourth form in frequencies have not been reported for the sets of vowels being compared. So we're going to go up high for compared. The other tonics, the pre-final tonics, are going to be higher, but not that high. Can you try it again? But this possibility is not open when the fourth form in You got it. That's what I meant. That's exactly what I meant. So apply that in the future. Tonics are higher than just the plain old stressed syllables, but if it's not the final tonic in the sentence or in the utterance, maybe it'll be the final tonic of a phrase that's very important, like if it's a thin how or something, it will be pretty high. But if it's not utterance final, don't make the tonic too high because you need that high pitch to signal the end of the utterance. Okay, so one problem is we usually do not have F4 data. When people collect formant data, very often it's only F1, F2, or F1, F2, F3. We usually don't have F4. So if we don't have the data, forget it. This is not going to work. Go on. Alternative method is to assume that each set of vowels is representative of the 
That was really nice. There's one picky thing I can point out, but that was a very good reading, especially because you said an alternative method. Is it a compound? No, in theory, it should be alternative method, but Annie said alternative method, and it was correct because contrast, exactly. We talked about one method. Here's one method. Here's an alternative method. So you got it spot on. That was really good. Um, the only picky thing I'd pick at is representative of the, representative of the complete range, negakai. Tonic continuation rise can mean any day now pause. That's the only thing. Everything else was great. Um, of the complete range of a speaker's vowel qualities. Okay? Mm. Keep going and then we'll explain it. Then we can express the common frequency of each vowel in terms of the total range of the of that moment in that Speakers All right, here's method two. Instead of using F4, which we don't have, we don't have F4 data, so we have to forget it. The other thing we could do, or one of the other things we could do, is we assume. So, our first jiaxi is that F4 corresponds to head size. Here's a different jiaxi for a different method, and that is if we take the vowel values or the values. For all of the vowels in a speaker's entire range, just the Igrian, Hatsungo range, Hasoyo the form and data for their range. Nahona, May Ika Mu in, Woman Jo Gate Ha, Sai Gadong Shi. So we express the form and frequency of each vowel in terms of the total range of that form in the speaker's voice. So, Zuli Tu Shen Ge Yi. One of them is stressed, the other one is unstressed. One of them is at the end of the sentence, one's in the middle, one's at the beginning. What are we going to do with that? We're going to use that as a representative of that vowel for that speaker. So we can express the form and frequency of each vowel in terms of the total range. Mm, of the form of that format in the speaker's voice. So, um, mega mu yin, woman jo hui chu, woman jo hui suan, yiga zhi. And then, this should minimize the differences between extreme vowels, falsely assuming that all speakers of all languages pronounce e, a, u in much the same way. So, Um, we're going to figure out the values for each vowel compared to all of the others in that person's range. Um, we're assuming then that megan in the e, megan in the a, megan in the u, the fine do cha bu do. This is a wu de, because we're going to do a jiaxi, like yong zi ge method. So let's keep going and see if it'll get clear. T? Mm hmm. Okay, he's saying something a little bit new that sort of is a conclusion or sort of is a, an outcome of what we're talking about. So here they're saying our goal here is to get rid of some of the individual variation because it's not convenient to use data when there's so much variation from individual to individual. We want something that's very generalizable. So the first method was to try to use head size. The second method is Okay? So they're trying to, trying to um, 
，一个人的所有的一，这个地方的一，另外一个地方的一，另第三个地方的一，平均起来，这个变成一的一个代表。平均起来的话，那最高的、最低的，它会稍微没有那么 extreme， 对不对？所有的一，我们全部放在一起平均起来，所有的 a 全部放在一起平均起来，我们再来比较一跟 a。要不然，这个人的 E 可能非常高，那个人的 E 非常哦， oh, 他别的地方那个 E 可能非常低。We're just going to try to get representative values of the vowels. I don't think this was really clear. I don't think it was clear enough myself when I was saying it, but now I think it's pretty clear. So he had just to show. Let's go over it again to make sure that we got it. So each set of vowels is representative of the、uh, range of a speaker's vowel qualities. Then we can express the form and frequency of each vowel in terms of the total range of that form and the speaker's voice. So we just all the vowels appear in different places of that vowel, aggregated together, using this to represent this vowel. The form and data is like this. This and that is like this. Otherwise, the individual data. We have no way to compare this speaker and that speaker. So we now put the vowel data in one speaker to make it more fixed. Not too extreme or too high. 不要有两个 extreme， 让它比较偏中间一点。Okay, that's the best I can do on this now. Let's keep going. Much of the work of the applied phonetician today is concerned with computer speech technology, and is directed toward improving speech synthesis systems. The greatest challenges in the field of speech synthesis are concerned with improvements in intonation and rhythm. Synthetic speech often sounds unnatural because the intonation is too stereotyped. To get the correct pitch changed,、uh, changes, one must know pitch the changes. pitch changes. One must know the speaker's attitude toward the world in general, and to the topic under discussion in particular. Uh huh. Topic under discussion. Topic under discussion in particular. All right. Let's understand this. First, the last sentence of the preceding paragraph. We cannot just take vowels from anybody, and then output a phonetic transcription. Remember when I posted on Facebook? There was this vowel trainer where you hear different speakers producing vowels, and you're supposed to identify them. Did some of you try that out? 你们有印象吗 ？I posted a link, and I thought Wendy tried it out. Okay, right. Now, at the beginning, you probably made a lot of mistakes. No? Okay, so you got five wrong. That was a very good score. I got about the same number wrong. It's my native language, my native dialect. But the problem is that, for example, a and a, which are a problem in Taiwan English, there's a great Range of a and a in American English. If you're talking to different speakers, so for example,、um, bed will sound more like bad in some people's speech, and they put them together. 不同的人，它是一样放在那里让你听。So this person is saying a,、uh, and that person is saying a.、Uh, their a sounds like a to me compared to the the other speaker's a. But if I heard that other speaker. Just speaking normally, I would have no trouble. Because I know his tone will be different. This different tone of people and this person put together, our A and A are not absolute truths. They 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 are But for this person, a is a, which is why he says we cannot write a computer program that will accept any individual's vowels as input and then output a narrow tra phonetic transcription because we're going to make mistakes because different people have different values for the vowels. We're clear on that, right? So this makes it really, really hard for speech recognition by computer. It's really hard. There's so much dialect and individual variation. It's really hard for a computer to get this right. You can't expect it to get it all right. He says we cannot, we just cannot do it. We can raise the probability that it's right. We can raise the rate of accurate、um, transcriptions, but we can't, we can't expect it to ever be completely right. It's not going to happen. Okay. And if you've ever tried out speech recognition with your computer, and I've mentioned this before, have you tried it out with Word? 
。你们试过没有 ？OK， do you know about this function in Word？ Right. We tried it then, right? Yes, I remember. So some of you, anyway. Do you remember from freshman English? Did we do it in all sections? I had you try to、um, transcribe or try to、um, read something into Word, and then they will do speech recognition and type it out for you. And you can do it in both English and Chinese, depending on your system. I have English. I guess you have Mandarin for yours. According to what my students tell me, the rate of accuracy is much better for English than Chinese. The rate of accuracy for Chinese was about sixty percent. Sixty percent. Do you know what I'm talking about, Tina? Okay, I don't know if I did it in all sections now. I'm not sure. But under Tools in Word, you can choose speech recognition, and then you train it. You read a few paragraphs into it that they give you, and then it will type them out. And if it makes mistakes, you tell it, and then it will correct it. So after you've trained it for a while, you can use Word to do speech recognition for you. You just read in what you want to type, and The computer will recognize what you're saying and type it out for you. You haven't done that before, okay? So maybe I only did it in one section. You were probably in my own section, Annie. The other two sections kind of mailed zuo. I mean, we had two hours a week, and the others had only one with me. So I probably only did it in one of the sections. So those of you who haven't tried it, try it out. Put it down. I've given this as an assignment every year. Go to Word. Go to Tools, and then. It's called Yin or something like that in Chinese. I forget. You'll find it. Go under Tools, Gongzhi, and then try out the speech recognition. Just get a paragraph in Chinese. Uh huh. Okay. They call it that. So long. Yes. Okay. Good. And we've got it. Just get a paragraph in Chinese. Read it, and see how it does. They have only Chinese. They don't have English, right? Because my impression is, it can't have any other language. It can't have only one because it takes up a huge amount of memory. It's really a lot of resources. So whatever you have, try it out. Mine is in English. I use an English system. Wendy, Wendy, you want to hear? Oh, word, word, language. Oh, how can it be in there? This is old one. I'm sorry, my stuff is out of date. I don't want to change systems,、um, so you will have to find it in the new system. Do you have details, Jerome? No, I I haven't tried it out, so I don't have details. Okay, Annie, do you know?、Huh? Do you know exactly how to find it in the newer system? Mine is XP. I'm using Windows XP. Oh, that's why we can communicate. Okay. <laughs> If you have a newer system, find it yourself. That's your job. Find it yourself. Find speech recognition. 语音辨识系统 Wherever it is, under the old system, it's under Word Tools 工具下面的语语音 or something like that. Speech recognition in English, I think. Find it and try it out. Read a paragraph. This is an assignment. Do it, okay? And I want you to tell me how accurate it is. Try out a paragraph. Read it. And then if it's not good enough, you can do further training. At least. I, I think it still works the same. You can train it some more, so it gets used to your voice. It makes adjustments for your individual variation, and then it will do better in the future.、Um, there is another thing to try out to compare it with, and it is Dragon. Find it online, Dragon. I believe you can do it online for free. You may be able to download it for free as well. So Dragon Systems. Just look up Dragon and speech recognition. I have a Dragon speech app on my iPad. If you have an iPad or iPhone, get the Dragon app. It's free. I'm sure they have other ones you pay for, but that the one I'm using is free and it works very well. It's really good for English. It's very good. So for English, look for Dragon online. If you have an iPad or iPhone or something similar, get the app. Try it out. If you have just a regular PC, I believe you can either do it online or you can probably download a program as well. I'm not sure. I'm pretty sure you can do it online. So try out both of them. Try out Word. Try out Dragon, and see how it does. Okay, if Dragon may have Chinese as well, but try out whatever you can. 有有中文就是中文，只有英文就用英文 Okay, assignment. 
and tell me, report back to me how well each one did. Okay, let's go on. In addition, the syntax of the utterance must be taken into account, as well as various higher level pragmatic considerations, such as whether the word or a synonym of it has been used in a whether the word or a synonym of it whether the word or a synonym of it has been used in a previous sentence. All right, let's just stop there for a minute to make sure we're understanding. Now, vowels are already a problem. We already saw in the previous paragraph that a computer cannot be expected to give the correct transcription for every single vowel from every person because there's just too much variation. Then it says the next thing that's really hard in speech technology. Now they're talking about speech synthesis. So speech recognition is 语音辨识. And that's called ASR, Automatic Speech Recognition. What we're talking about now, I have no explanation for that, unless there was a power failure, but the lights were fine. I don't know what happened. <clears throat> um, the next one is um, speech synthesis, which is called 语言合成语言, that's what we call it. 合成语言, synthesize speech. 合成语言. So, you've read about it already in vowels and consonants, that it's hard to get a computer to listen well, and it can produce human speech, and it's actually pretty good, but there are still lots of bugs in it. Do any of you use Siri? Do any of you? Okay, how does Siri do? Does it understand you correctly most of the time? Um, unless I speak correctly. Oh, you have to speak very carefully. Yeah. Okay, then? Because it works better when in English than in Chinese. Okay, that was my experience that I just mentioned. The English works better than the Chinese for a word as well. And so if you speak clearly, it usually understands you, yeah. and then it will respond. Yeah. And Oh, really? Yeah. Ah. I turned off the... ah, so you could get it to speak. Yeah. So turn it on and try it. Okay. Have you listened to it before? No. Try it out. Anybody else have Siri on an iPhone? Okay. Um, the point here is, what is the really hard thing? We already talked about one really hard thing in speech recognition. Now we're talking about speech synthesis. What's a really hard thing? What is the hardest part? Intonation, Intonation and rhythm. So timing. Humans are extremely, extremely, extremely sensitive to timing. You know, that's why we're so interested in wideband spectrograms, because we want to know the changes from one millisecond to the next, and we're sensitive to them. Up to, I'd say, even less than 20 milliseconds, we are sensitive to them. You know? It only takes like a difference of a few milliseconds, and we can perceive it. And it will change our whole attitude toward what we hear with different pauses or different lengths. We're very, very, very sensitive to timing, we humans. Computers are not good at capturing all those differences in timing that we want them to get. We humans do it because we react emotionally to them. We apply it emo uh, automatically. But it's really hard to get a computer to react in the same ways we do because these differences are very, very xi. They're really, really hard. And we don't understand them. We react that way. We know what we're doing. We know how a certain utterance makes us feel. But we're, it's hard for us to analyze it and tell a computer how to do the same thing. So timing is one, and that's rhythm. The other one is intonation. That's really hard to get the computer to do the right things. That gives the speech the right feeling. That will give the listener the right feeling when they hear the speech. Okay? It says that synthetic speech often sounds unnatural because the intonation is too stereotyped. So, are you going now? All the questions, are you going now? They do it in a very robot-like way. Okay? It, can't, it will be different from uh, if we're listening to a real person at this day. Oh, are you going now? Okay? Are you going now? We have a lot of ways of saying, giving different messages. But the computer will just, are you going now? Because that's all we'll, we'll probably teach it. And it won't know when it should use which one. So, in other words, we have to know the speaker's attitude, right? 
One of them, they're being seductive. One of them, they're being neutral. One of them, they're angry. We have to know which one it is. And how is the computer going to know that? In addition, the syntax of the utterance must be taken into account. Because we know that, what? If we have mentioned a word before, what, what happens? We de-stress it. And even if we haven't mentioned that word, but we've talked about that thing using a different word, we still have to distress, de-stress the word when it comes up, if it means the same thing or, or nearly the same thing. OK, let's go on. The rhythm of the sentence depends not only on the segmental influences, influences. influences discussed in earlier parts of this book, but also on the particular emphasis that the speaker wishes to convey at that moment. Okay, so right now, because we are paying special attention to one per certain thing, or maybe there's a certain thing that the students didn't understand well, so we'll emphasize certain words. Depending on the situation, what information is most important to the people at that time, it's going to change. Let's go on. If we are going to make synthetic speech lively and interesting, we have to develop computer programs that are very linguistically sophisticated and can also simulate human emotions. So the computer has to keep track of, is this word new or did it occur before or did a synonym occur before and it's going to have to change its emphasis later on. That's a very, very complicated program you have to write. Just that thing alone, right? Let's go on. Speech recognition systems are largely the province of engineers, but phoneticians also play a part. For a long time, we have been able to use computers to distinguish single words, such as the digits. Single words. Single words, such as the digits zero through nine. More recently, several systems. Several systems. Several systems, have been developed that can recognize limited sets of words in task spe uh, task specific situations in which the computer the computer can structure the dialogue for example in an airline reservations uh, in an airline reservation system mm -hmm. airline reservation system because reservation system comes first in an airline reservation system the computer can s ask which day of the month do you wish to travel at what uh, at what time? At what time? At what time? And what airplane? Uh, airline? To what airport? Each of these questions has only a limited set of possible answers. Computers can do all this and more and more and more with with sufficient accuracy for commercial purposes, but they cannot as yet serve as court reporters, producing court reporters. Court reporters producing an accurate written transcript of ordinary speech or ordinary, uh, or ordinary speech uh, spoken by people with a right, wide range of accents and different personal characteristics. Very good. The last sentence I think we all understand. We can't do that. We've already discussed that. But computers do better at recognizing speech if there is only a limited number of possible answers. For example, what day of the week are you leaving? How many possible answers do we have? Six. Right. That makes it easier. If there's only a limited number of possible answers, it can do pretty well. But if it has to understand everything in a language, it's nearly impossible. Go on. We will conclude this section with a few comments on speaker identification in legal proceedings. Spectrograms of a person's voice are sometimes called voice prints, and they are said to be as individual as fingerprints. This is a greatly exaggerated clam. Uh, hmm? clam. Hmm? Claim. Huh? Sorry. Claim. 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 Mm -hmm. As if, um, if, if it were true, it would be very useful. Banks would be able to verify a depositor's identity over the phone, over the telephone, and the police would be able to make a positive identification of cr criminals whose conversations have been recorded. Some individual characteristics are recorded in spectrograms. The positive of the fourth, 
、uh, the position, sorry, the position of the fourth and higher formats in most vowels is indicative. Is indicative.、Mm? In, in, Indicative、mm-hmm. is indicative of a speaker's voice,、uh, of a speaker's voice quality rather than the linguistic aspect of the sounds. Aspects, A- aspects、mm-hmm. of the sounds.、Mm-hmm. Similarly, the exact locations of the higher formats in nasals depend to a great extent on individual、um, psy- uh, social Physio. physiological. Characteristic of the speaker.、Uh, do the last four words, five words. Physiological. Physiological. Physiological characteristic. Physiological f- characteristics of the speaker. Very good. Okay, so he's just going to say a few things at the end now about speaker identification, which you've already talked about earlier.、Uh, we've said it now, at least twice. Now the third time that.、Um, Spectrograms are not like fingerprints. We cannot use them to definitively identify somebody, one person as opposed to another person. If if we could do that, it would be very useful. We could identify people calling on the phone, and you could get your data that way. We could identify criminals if we'd recorded their pronunci-、uh, their their conversations.、Um, but it doesn't work that way. We do have some individual characteristics, mainly four F four and above. Um, and they sh- they they tell us something about a speaker's voice quality, less about vowels. For example, the difference between ah and a,、ah. we don't get that usually in F4 and above. They tell us more about the individual's voice quality. And it says what else? The exact locations of the higher formants and nasals depend to a great extent on individual physiological characteristics. 你自己的那个生理构造就是这样子 Those are mainly what influence the higher formants. Let's go on. Makes a call. Makes a call, and they、uh, identify which which person it is. Immediately, it's like it doesn't really work. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> they can they can actually get some help from spectrograms and other things. They're 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 different tools that will give you help, but they can only give you a probability. 他可能是这个人是那个人的百分之七十八的几率 That's about all they can do. Yeah. Okay. Okay. There are also a number of features observable on spectrograms that indicate a speaker's speech habits. And do not depend on the speaker's language. For example, there is a great, great deal of individuality in the length and type of aspiration that occurs after initial voices stops. Okay, that's one way to measure difference between individuals or differences. For example, take. Wow, excuse me, my voice. Take, or take, or take. I have a lot of different. Levels of aspiration, right? All of them are okay. They're all t, but each person probably has their own habits about how much they, how much aspiration they use. Take, or take, or take, very little at all. For example, okay. The rate of transition of the formants after voice stops also varies from one individual to another. Okay, so、um, bad. Bad. It could be the voice stop to vowel. The that variation is a little bit. It can be used to change different people, different person. Okay. The rate of transition, that is, it goes from voice stop to vowel formant. The that speed. Okay. How fast? The rate of transition. Okay. Individuals also vary considerably in their mean pitch. And in the range of fundamental frequencies that they use. All right. So one th- is your 平均的 F zero. 每个人的平均 F zero 不一样。然后每个人的 range. Some people have really wide ranges of frequencies, and others speak in a really flat voice. You can hardly tell any variation at all, right? So 每个人的习惯不一样 Some people have very flat voices. 
Some people have really exaggerated ups and downs. Some people are somewhere in between. So those are different individual characteristics we can use to, um, to describe the differences from one individual to another. Okay? No, nobody knows how many individuals share similar characteristics. There are occasions when one might say that the voice on a When one might say that. When, when, one might say that. One might say that. One might say that. Listen again. There are occasions when one might say that. One even is a dummy pronoun. When one might say that. When one might say that. Mm -hmm. The voice on a particular recording is probably not. Probably. That's stress, so you got to slow down. It's probably not the same as the voice on some other recording. On some other recording. On some other recording. Contrast, right? And times when one might say that. When one when, when one when, when one might say. When one might say mm -hmm. that the voice on a recording could. When the voice on a recording could be the same. The voice on the recording could be the same as a voice on another. On another. On another. On another. Right. That's what I was saying to Wendy. We just are just guess. We just he can tell you, probably it's him, maybe it's her, different guess. Yeah. An expert. An expert's opinion. On the probability of two voices being the, being the same, certainly. Ah, Being the same. Everybody's chiming in. Stop at the end of a clause. There should be a comma after same. Pretend there's a comma there. There doesn't. There isn't. Actually, in a composition, we wouldn't put it there, but pretend there's a comma. It will help you read. Um, an expert's opinion on the probability of two, of two voices being the same. Being the same. Being the same. Mm -hmm. Certainly has an evidential value. The weight given to that evidence being for the jury to decide. So an expert might say there is a an 82% probability that this voice is the same as that voice. Does that decide the case? No. Who's going to decide the case? The jury. Yeah, patient one. You don't have that system in Taiwan. Okay? Patient one. Jury. But this is not the best way of reporting the results of a comparison between comparison. two. Comparison. Comparison. Uh -huh between two voices. It is impossible to make a valid calculation of the probability of making a correct identification in any particular case, as no two cases are ever the same. There are seldom two equally good recordings of the voices in question, with both speakers talking for comparable amounts of time. Mm -hmm. Talking. Both speakers talking for comparable for comparable mm -hmm. amounts of time. Comparable is also correct. The known and unknown voices. Mm -hmm. What are we going to stress? Unknown. Right. The known and unknown voices may be saying the same words. The same so words. The same words. Mm -hmm. But they are seldom both talking naturally. Neither one being excited. Neither, neither one being excited. Neither one being excited or worried about making a recording, and neither, and neither one bored or angry. On any pair of recordings, it's possible that the one voice is disguised or deliberately imitating the other voice. D. Uh -huh, right. In theory, it would be possible to set up experiments that make these points that that take these points and many others into account when comparing a particular pair of voices, but without elaborate. Stop it stops. But mm -hmm. without. Mm -hmm. 
elaborate prior testing, it is literally impossible to calculate the to calculate to calculate mm -hmm. the statistical probability of being right or wrong in a particular case. Particular. Particular. Particular case. Okay. Right. Your reading is really very nice overall, but you rush a bit too much. You're not stopping at the places you need to stop. Phrasing. 就是短句问题. 你要开始多留一短句, and then put the continuation rise in. That's good. And also the particular and calculate. Let's go on. Last paragraph of the chapter. The better way of reporting the results of an event investigation into whether two voices are the same is in terms of the likelihood radio. Hmm? Ratio. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's very close to radio, isn't it? <laughs> With a tap, it would become radio, except we make it ratio. The likelihood ratio, the likelihood that the two voices in question are the same as are the, the. other same, the same. same. Mm as compared with the likelihood that they are different. Mm -hmm. Likelihood ratio. Likelihood, likelihood ratio. ratio. Okay, it's a compound. Go on. This is, this is a more complex statistic, statistical measure. 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 Yeah. But it does not depends on, mm -hmm. depend on prior probabilities being known. OK. So it's hard to get two recordings that are really comp Com uh, comparable. Maybe one person is really angry and the other person is just really bored. So if you want to compare these two recordings to, and then give, a, give your opinion on whether it's the same voice or not, it's really hard. Because in addition to the inherent fallibility of spectrograms, the, the recordings may be so different. One is really loud, one is really quiet, one is really angry, one is really calm. It's just really, really hard to do this. One person may be trying to imitate someone else's voice. Some people are really, really good at that, imitating someone else's voice. And if they're good at that, it's going to make it really, really tough. So in the end, he's saying, all we can do is give you an approximate probability. 大概是一样的,或者大概不太可能是一样的,一个百分比,这样子,一个几率. And then it says that a better way of reporting the results of an investigation into whether they're the same or not is um, the likelihood that two voices are the same as compared with the likelihood that they are different. Okay, so they're saying that 你先比较一下它是一样的声音的几率有多高它是不同的人的那个几率有多高其实是两个不同的东西算起来也蛮麻烦的 and it says that it's pretty hard um, the likelihood that two voices and questions are the same, yeah so, 你, 你要比较一下, He's just saying this is a different statistical method. This method produces better results. And don't worry about that. Okay? It's just saying that it's hard to come up with the probabilities. There are some methods that work better than others, but none of them is really. Absolute. None of them is really, really reliable. That's all. We finished the chapter. Okay. Wow. That's really something. You have only a page and a half of exercises. You have only a page, of, a page and a half of exercises, but these are probably the most difficult ones in the book. And like I said, don't freak out. Don't get depressed. And don't get into a funk. Don't push yourself too much, but give it your best effort. We want you to try and read this first spectrogram. Okay? And then you've got the next one identified and it tells you what you need to do. You need to transcribe, you need to segment, and blah, blah, blah. And then you've got a little math. We've already been over this last class. So if you have big problems, um, you can post them over Facebook and then we can maybe offer some help. But do your best. Question, Wendy? Um, I just read through the pages. We, we spent uh, over a month on this chapter. That's fast. For a chapter this heavy? That's fast. 
we haven't finished everything because next hour we have the decibels tutorial and then there's one web page that I told you is about musical instruments. That one is really fun. We have to find time to do that. So even if we have to take time away from something else, we will have to find time to do that. That one is really fun. So this is it for chapter eight. We'll mark the exercises on Monday. Please work at it I mean, give it your best effort. Start early, post your questions. So it goes relatively smoothly on Monday. Okay, we really need to be thorough about this chapter. That will be it for eight. We're going to start on nine on Monday after we mark eight. Okay? Break and then decibels. Take a break. Okay, make it fast. We're going to start on the, com on the, the tutorial, everybody. We don't have much time left. We've taken up a lot of time for different things. The chapter went on long, longer than we expected, but at least we finished it. And then they needed to re-record three of you reading the text. These things happen. There haven't been that many glitches, but when they happen, we just have to fix them. There's not going to be enough time to finish the tutorial. It's really heavy. <laughs> um, so I'm thinking we can either break it up, I can start it now, or we can do the whole thing next class. Which would you prefer? You'd like to break it up? That's fine. That's Carol who suggested it. How about the rest of you? What do you think? Break it up? OK, we'll start because it's heavy. And what you can do is you get the introduction to it, and then you can look at it yourself. The file is online, so it's open for you all to access and to look at. So when it starts getting confusing, you can start reading it yourself more carefully. And at least we'll get a start on it. OK, I haven't broken it up in other years. At least not intentionally. But we'll try it out and see how it goes. Please get your calculators out and ready. You won't need them much, or maybe we won't even get to that part today. I have a feeling I left my, com my calculator in my office. OK. OK. Now this is, not the com this is not the tutorial itself. This is just an introduction. Remember I told you that there were two paragraphs in the earlier editions of Latifoged that were omitted in subsequent editions. Starting with edition five, they were gone. One year, we were almost done with eight, and I thought, we haven't talked about decibels yet. It's because the, com the, the paragraphs were missing. Because the, the paragraphs were gone. Other years, when we ran into these, I knew that we had to do the tutorial to explain what was going on. All right, so 12 is called Understanding Decibels, a PowerPoint slideshow. There are a number of differences between the fifth edition of Peter Latifoged's course in phonetics, which we are current. Oh, this is not the new version. Ah, Never mind, we'll use the old one. Okay, this um, is Differences between the 5th and 6th edition of Latifoged's A Course in Phonetics and earlier editions. One is the mention of various issues relating to amplitude and intensity. In the earlier editions, he had these paragraphs about amplitude in Chinese. Zhen fu and intensity, qiang du. The following two paragraphs from the 4th edition do not appear in the 5th or 6th. So here we go. This will probably be ito wu shui, but see if you can understand as much as you can as you go along. Or try to understand as much as you can as you go along. In general, the loudness of a sound depends on the size of the variations in air pressure that occur. So far so good, right? Xingying de da xia, yao kan, qi ya bian hua, de nega cha bie you duo da, dei no problem with that, right? Just as frequency is the acoustic measurement most directly corresponding to the pitch of a sound, we know that frequency and pitch are related, but they're not the same thing. Which one is physical and which one is subjective? Frequency is physical and, and it's also objective, and pitch is subjective, right? It's, depends on our ears and the way they filter and perceive sounds. In the same way, acoustic intensity is the appropriate measure corresponding to loudness. So our relatively objective measure is intensity. 
and our subjective gan shou is loudness. So we're going to talk about how to calculate intensity, which gives us the sensation of loudness or quietness of a sound. The intensity is proportional to the average size. Now you know you're going to get lost, right? The intensity is proportional to the average size or amplitude of the variations in air pressure. Well, actually, if you slow down, you'll get it. It's proportional. It, usually, it is usually measured in decibels. So far, so good, no problem. Decibels are abbreviated as small d capital B because capital B stands for bell. It's the guy who thought up this idea of using decibels to measure the loudness of sounds. So it is usually measured in decibels relative to the amplitude of some other sounds. Decibels are relative. They are not absolute. The same way we're talking about vowels. Vowel differences are also relative. That's what we just said about vowels, right? So, in a sort of similar way, um, okay, it is usually measured in decibels relative to the amplitude of some other sounds. In the same way, we figure out decibels by comparing two sounds. That's what I was getting at. You cannot give any absolute measure of the loudness of a sound because there is no such thing. There is no absolute loudness, absolute quietness. We don't have it. We have to compare this sound with this sound. We can try to get the quietest, quietest, quietest sound we can hear and then use that as a basis for comparing all the other sounds, and that's what we do. But we have to have a baseline for comparison. Okay? So keep in mind that decibels are relative. They're a relative measurement. We're always comparing them to something else. Remember when we were talking about suprasegmentals, we said something similar. Stress is always relative compared to something else. You do something in this syllable that we don't do in that syllable, then it's stressed. So suprasegmentals like stress, those are always relative. They're never absolute. Now, loudness, which is actually one of the suprasegmentals, is loudness of a sound. That is always figured, calculated, in comparison to some other sound. So far, so good, right? Technically, to get, now technically, when he says technically, then we're going to have a lot of scientific stuff. To get the decibel difference, one has to compare the power ratio, where the power is defined as the square of the mean amplitude, uh, right? We're flying away, sort of? Never mind, I'll just read through it and it'll be explained in the tutorial. To get the decibel difference, one has to compare the power ratio where the power is defined as the square of the mean amplitude, mean is ping jun, average, variation in air pressure. The difference in decibels is 10 times the common logarithm of the power ratio of the two sounds or 20 times the log of the amplitude ratio. Made no sense, right? Made no sense. That's, that's what I knew would be a problem. It was in the old edition. And I knew that up to here was okay, but here we don't have enough background. We need to learn about power and logarithms and intensity and all that stuff. We have to learn all that in order to understand this. That's why I had you do the logarithms first. Um, the human ear can hear. Now it's okay. The human ear can hear, perhaps tolerate would be a better word, a range of about 120 decibels. So the range of sounds that we can handle from the very, very, very quietest sound up to the loudest sound that we can deny. Then so, I should not so tight, Joe, because it will probably break our eardrum or make us deaf. Goes from zero decibels to 120 decibels. Well, I'm going to arrange just as down. Okay, keep that in mind. That's important. Zero to 120. You probably need that for the test. Okay, that much you need to know. So, zero to 100 decibels, 120 decibels. That's the range of human hearing. Zero, we can barely hear anything. 120 is so loud, it's probably going to break our eardrum. Or it's going to make us deaf if we listen too long. Although if you persist in listening to sounds 110 to 120 decibels above the quietest sound you can hear, you will soon go deaf. 
as many rock musicians have found out. And if you look into the bi biographies of famous rock musicians who give really, really loud performances, most of them suffer hearing loss. Almost all of them have to wear earplugs when they're performing. They have really loud performances. And it really does work. And there's something I discovered at a recent concert. It actually is by Sigur Ross. You know them from Iceland? You don't know them? They're pretty popular. I happened to just be listening outside in the hall. I was in the building in the hallway. And the sound was so loud, it was making my body vibrate. I mean, it's not just those really loud sounds that make our bodies vibrate. I was driving to school today, and I had the radio on. And I found that different levels of volume made different parts of my body vibrate. So now you know that every space has its own frequency. I could feel different frequencies making different parts of my body vibrate. If you're very sensitive when you're driving a car, because in the car you're sitting on the seat and that's attached to the sound system, I could feel suddenly at a certain pitch a part of my leg would be vibrating. So it's not just really loud music that does it. I didn't have it on that loud. It didn't feel that loud in the car. Of course, it's louder in the car because of traffic, but I had the windows closed. So in fact, different Frequencies are going to make different parts of our body vibrate anyway. But at this very loud concert, I could feel my body just being set into a very big vibration. And so that's one of the things that makes people high at a concert. All right. So anyway, you have to protect yourself from those really loud sounds. It will really hurt your hearing. When one sound has an intensity of five decibels greater than another, then it is approximately twice as loud. We're going to change that a little bit in the tutorial because I checked many sources. These numbers are not as accurate as I think they should be, okay? So if a sound has an intensity five decibels greater than another, it's about twice as loud. So decibels work on a logarithmic scale. 10 decibels, or 20 decibels, no, just twice as loud. Okay? Five decibels, it will sound twice as loud, more or less. Actually, it's six decibels, not five. A change in intensity of one decibel is a little more than the just noticeable difference in loudness. So from mm to mm, one, a tiny, tiny bit louder, that's about one decibel. One decibel is a little more than that. Figure 8.3 shows the waveform of the phrase, we saw three dogs, and underneath it, a record of the intensity, okay, I lost my place here, uh, intensity and decibels. Intensity is always a relative measure. One sound has an intensity of so many decibels more or less than another. We know that. The zero point in figure 8.3 is arbitrarily taken to be the level recorded for the silence. How do we figure zero decibels? It's actually the quiet room noise. This is not a quiet room. We've got this on, we've got air conditioning. But if you have a recording studio, and I gave you a link on Facebook called an anoche uh, ano echoic, sorry, anoche I can't say it, anechoic chamber. Echoic means huiyin. An si negative. So is an anechoic chamber. I put that online on Facebook. So you can go back to that now, and now you know what we're talking about. It's a room with the very, very lowest level of sound that we can create. It's got walls that absorb sound. So this, if you make any sound, they won't bounce, the sound won't bounce off the walls and be loud. It will be absorbed by the material in the walls. So, you can hear, it's creepy, you hear no sounds at all, basically. But you will hear the sound of air molecules moving. You think that's crazy? In a very, very, very quiet place, like the desert, you can actually hear that, the air molecules moving and the blood rushing in your head. If it gets really quiet, you can hear that. The point is that you can't have zero noise. There's always some sound. So we try to make a room as quiet as we possibly can, and we call that zero decibels. That's what we compare other levels of sound or loudness to, is that very quietest room sound that we can achieve. That's zero decibels, okay? So everything else is going to be a number in comparison to that zero. So far, so good? 
Yes? We're just going to finish this page. We won't go to the actual tutorial. Mm. So actually the quiet room noise at the beginning and end of the utterance. The vowels in we and C have a level of about 34 decibels above the zero that we're talking about. So we and C, the E is quite loud. It's about 34 decibels. The vowels in saw and dogs have about 10 decibels greater still, making them well over twice as loud. So saw, dogs, our mouth is open wider. They have more volume. They're louder. So they're going to be about 10 decibels greater, about 44 decibels, which makes them more than twice as loud. Remember, twice as loud is about 5 or 6 decibels. The two fricatives, s and th, are much lower, s having a mean of about 17 decibels and th being about 13 decibels above the bass line. So remember we were talking about th being the quietest fricative, the quietest consonant in English, th, quietest sound. Generally, vowels such as a ah and a, ah, in which the mouth is more open, are about 5 decibels greater than the vowels e and u. Assuming all these vowels have been said with an equal degree of stress. So if we put them in the same phonetic environment or we emphasize them equally much, then um, a ah and a ah will have a sound about 5 decibels greater than e and u. In this particular phrase, the words saw and dogs were stressed. So their vowels have an even higher intensity. So if we add stress, the decibel level will go up. Stress makes them louder. Loudness is not the most important marker of stress, but it is one of them. In this particular case, we read that. In any utterance, the actual intensity of a segment will depend on many factors, such as its position in the sentence. The degree of stress on each word, and the personal characteristics of the speaker. Okay, so actually these two paragraphs were not so bad except for that one sentence, right? That one sentence is kind of hopeless. We'll just finish this page and then we'll be done for today. Perhaps Professor Latifoget omitted it because, omitted these paragraphs because they introduced a number of new issues that he felt didn't, he didn't have enough space to go into deeply in the book. He does explain them in another book, Elements of Acoustic Phonetics, and Professor Johnson explains them in his book. It's... Uh, um, acoustic and auditory phonetics. And it was because I felt that considerable additional background knowledge was required in order to understand this paragraph that I prepared the following slideshow on decibels. Now, without the paragraph as a reminder, it might be easy to forget about decibels completely, but they are very important in understanding acoustics, including acoustic phonetics, so we will proceed. And if you feel that you have a pretty good handle on how logarithms work, it wasn't that hard, was it? It's time to begin the decibel slideshow. Be prepared to work through the material slowly and carefully. You may need to go over it a number of times to absorb it all, or at least the main points. Here is the link. The slideshow contains names of units of measurement that may be unfamiliar to you. Here's a site that helps you convert one type of unit to another. And we're not usually familiar. Most of us won't, won't be familiar with them. So you can use this site to help you convert one to the other. For example, micropascals to microbars. And then it goes on to the next page. I will just open the tutorial so you know what it looks like. And then you can have a look at it yourself if you want. But we're going to do it in class next time. There, thank you. Okay, it's in a different place in the old system. This is what it looks like. This is what's coming. Okay, that gives you an idea. Okay, so that's it. All right, what do we have to do for Monday? Exercises. Exercises, what else? Sorry? Read chapter 11, see if you have any questions. Okay, that's lower priority though. Higher priority is to do your exercises. Um, what else? Go over all of chapter 8, take notes on it. That's part of your notes for Monday, right? Go over the whole chapter, take notes on it to make sure you understand everything. Anything else? Don't forget vowels and consonants for next Wednesday. Anything else? 
Get ready for decibels. Bring your calculator. Okay, that'll do. <laughs> we'll see you on Monday.